Let me show you how this works and then I'll explain what I'm doing. You start with a piece of music you know. I have this piece on the brain because I just played it at a friend's wedding. And then the task is to put it in another key. So in this case, if I put it from the key of F into the key of B flat, it would sound like this. This is called transposition. And I'm kind of a missionary for this exercise because personally it changed the way that I think about music. Uh, and it's one of those things that's fairly straightforward to understand, but the real magic is in the application uh, because a lot of the benefits of this exercise will reveal themselves to you as you put it into practice. So let me show you how this would work on three example pieces of music. And along the way, I'll answer some common questions I get from students uh, and mention some of the benefits you'll start to see as you do this. For our first example, let's use just the melody of that piece I just played. This is the theme from Up by Michael Giacchino. What I'm going to do is number these notes based on the scale of the piece. Now, there are a couple prerequisites here. You need some familiarity with how to form your major scales. Uh, and I have a free resource. You're welcome to grab a PDF that shows the shapes of all 12 major scales. You do also need to identify the key of the piece. And usually you can do that by process of elimination if you do know your major scales. And sometimes if you're reading music, for example, you can just look at the key signature on the left side of the page. Uh, but sometimes that's a challenging part of this. So. Everything that we're gonna look at here comes after you have identified the key of the piece and after you have some basic idea of how to find your major scales on piano. But keep in mind, you don't have to be flawless with your major scales to benefit from this because I actually often give this exercise with a simple melody as a way for new students to learn their major scales. So let's apply these numbers. I'm in the key of F major. So the melody here is one, three, one, seven. One three seven six six one six five, and we can just start with that much if we like. Now the task is to go to the next key, and if you like, you can just jump around at random. I like to go to the next key, going counterclockwise in the circle of fifths, because very often that's the direction in which harmony moves in music. So I'm going to go to the next key in the circle of fifths. That'll be B flat, and I'll play the same numbers in the scale. So here's our B flat major scale. One three one seven, one three seven six six one six five, and this is where the first magic of this exercise starts to reveal itself. This is such a good way to learn the shapes of your major scales, so that they are connected to your ear, because when you just play your major scales up and down, that's a great thing to do. Uh, it will be a first way of learning to recognize where these major scales are on the piano. Uh, but what it doesn't do is push your ear to identify how the different notes of the scale sound. Whereas when you play a melody like this, you're having to jump around a lot. You know, here, one, three, one, seven. Especially when you're first starting to do this, you might go to the wrong note for that three. Maybe you'll go here. And you'll immediately recognize, oh, that actually doesn't sound like the correct note in this melody. That sounds wrong. So you're repeatedly testing whether you can find the correct number in the key. And also you're comparing that to the sound that you're holding in your head of a familiar melody. So it has this incredible effect of both teaching you to recognize these scales in a much more robust kind of improvisatory way that you can just make your way around the scale for a given key that was all B flat major instead of having to play it in sequence. Um, and then it's also really connecting the shape of the scale to your ear because you're thinking one, three, one, seven instead of B flat, D, B flat, A. So for this reason alone, uh, you can get so much out of this exercise. Uh, and usually this is just, this is where I start and stop with a lot of students is that uh, we pick some simple melodies that they like. 
and we start putting them in different keys. And a lot of students immediately over the course of you know a few weeks will start to understand their major scales in a new way. And I know that that can happen because that's what happened to me. I did this for the first time when I was in high school. I had been playing scales for years as part of classical lessons, but never in this kind of out of order way uh, and never having to associate the notes with numbers. So I started doing this when jazz teachers were telling me, you need to take a solo that you've transcribed and put it in different keys. Um, and immediately when I started doing that, I, I also realized that actually this was hard for me to do even with very simple things. So I went to nursery rhymes. I took Have You Met the Muffin Man through all 12 keys, and it really had an impact on my ear and on my knowledge of major scales. So this is where you should start. You know, Take any simple melody that you're familiar with, analyze the numbers, and then put it in all 12 keys. And this is a frequently asked question from students. Should it actually be all 12 keys? And how long should I spend on each key? And the answer to this that I would give is at the beginning, yes, it should be all 12 keys. Later on, you can pick and choose a few keys. And that's because this is gonna change over time. At the beginning, you're actually using the piece of music to learn your scales, right? You don't yet have a ton of familiarity with where the third is, say, in G flat major. So the first time you do this, uh, the biggest challenge is gonna be the shapes of the scales themselves. And then once you've done it a fair amount, you'll be really comfy with the shapes of all your scales. Um, and so this will be more about analyzing a specific piece of music and coming to understand it better in terms of numbers. And for that benefit, you can just pick a few keys. Sometimes I'll just learn a new piece and put it into one or two other keys. And that alone can have a big impact on how well I understand the piece of music. To show you a little bit about what I mean understanding a piece of music, let's look at our second example. So this is the chord progression to the Wilco song, How to Fight Loneliness. A classic minor key chord progression. Uh, and yes, you can do this exercise with minor keys, not just with major keys. So however you learn this chord progression, you know, maybe you would learn it from a chord chart, looking it up online, or maybe you can learn it by ear. But either way, you might start out just thinking of this as B minor, F sharp minor over A, G, and F sharp major. If you have to put it into another key though, you have to turn it into numbers. So if I wanna put it into the key, say of C minor, I'm going to have to turn it into numbers. One, five as a minor chord with seven in the bass, six, which is a major chord here, and five. So just putting it into one other key pushed me to actually think about the chord functions the numbers of the chords here, which is really what our ear hears. You know, when, when we recognize this as the same chord progression, even though I'm playing a completely different set of notes, that's because we recognize the numbers. We recognize the relationship between uh, the, the chords in this progression. So understanding the numbers means you understand the harmony better. And in this case, there's a lot to be learned from this chord progression if you haven't played a chord progression like this before, right? Uh, it's, it's a great example of looking at how a minor key chord progression can transition from using natural minor with its lowered seventh and lowered sixth compared to a major scale, and then move into a harmonic minor sound on the five chord, where we have this A sharp here, this raised seventh, And that gives us a stronger sense of momentum to come back to the one. Now, if that was a lot really fast and it went over your head, that's okay. Uh, the point there was just to show that 
there is something to be gained in understanding a chord progression simply from having to do an analysis of it. Um, and when I spout off about numbers and music theory on this channel, a lot of those things were not necessarily things that a teacher taught me in a classroom. A lot of those things I more or less discovered on my own organically through learning songs by ear and then putting them in different keys. So there might actually be some quirks about the way that I analyze music that came from my own self-discovery of this kind of analysis. And in the end, when it comes to your own understanding of music theory, that's what you want for yourself. You want your own you know, primary source uh, discoveries of the patterns in the music that you love. Uh, and that's what's gonna allow you to learn songs by ear easily and write music that's interesting to you. So that's the second benefit. You'll get a much better understanding of harmony and music theory by doing this exercise, not only with melodies, but with chord progressions. And there's one other benefit that I wanna talk about. Uh, and for this, I'll use an example of this very twisty melody to a jazz song by Eddie Harris uh, that a teacher asked me to put into all 12 keys when I was in high school. It sounds like this. That's just the first part of it, I'll be honest. I don't know if I can play the entire melody from memory anymore, it's been a while. But I took this melody into different keys and some of the notes in this melody are not diatonic. So that's something to note. You can do this with melodies that aren't purely diatonic and diatonic means all the notes belong to the major scale, right? So this note and this note in the key of B flat do not belong in the scale. I would call it the flat seven and the flat three. Um, and so as I'm taking this into other keys, I have to think about where the flat seven and the flat three are. Flat seven, flat three, one. So that's a nice little aside. You can learn to find these altered scale degrees, these non-diatonic notes, along with the diatonic notes. Uh, but the thing I really wanted to talk about with, with this example is that putting things into other keys helps teach you how to find good fingerings on the piano in a way that's more applicable to improvisation. So a big part of the challenge of improvising on the piano is that you need to be finding good fingerings for what you're playing on the fly. With a piece of classical music, you can like work out where your fingers should go on different parts of the piece. Uh, but with improvised music, you have to be coming up with the fingering as you play. Right. So the places that I put my fingers there were not predetermined because I was improvising, but I've developed instincts over time about how to think a little bit ahead and how to put my hand in the right place so that I'll have enough fingers for whatever I'm trying to do next. Uh, and something that really helped me learn those instincts was this exercise, because you have to find new fingerings uh, for this little excerpt of music that you're transposing every time you go into a new key. If I wanna play, right, you can see how that was kind of an awkward fingering when I tried to put this into a sharp key of, of E major. So I might have to explore and see if there's a way that I can finger it better. Maybe that was a little bit better. Um, and just messing around that way will teach you a lot about how to find economical fingerings on the piano. So this is another piece of advice I give students. Um, you know, they'll, they'll often worry that they're not using the best fingerings the first time they, they go through the circle of fifths with a new transposition exercise. And I think that's actually a benefit. It's not a problem uh, because what you can do is hang out in a certain key and play the same melody a few times and see if you can arrive at a better fingering for it. Um, and if you stick on the same melody that you're transposing for say a week, over the week you'll start to just have instincts about where you should put your fingers so that you can make your way through the melody without getting into an awkward bind with your fingers. So you can see there's a lot here. There are so many things you can get from this exercise uh, and it's very flexible. In a way, it's more like a, a category of practice, transposition, rather than a single exercise. Uh, but it's good to start simple and just do it with simple melodies because you'll get familiar with how this works. And then for the rest of your life as a musician, when you wanna learn some new skill or new rudiment or new lick or chord progression, you have a way of helping yourself understand it on a much deeper level by just applying this exercise. Remember to subscribe to my channel if you're interested in more piano education. Uh, and you can always go to my website, pianofluency.com for lessons, courses, and free resources. I'm Ted with Piano Fluency. Thanks for joining me.